All right, welcome back. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know Trump impersonator on the day to trying to impeach him, impeaching impersonator. Johnny D. Domenico, great friend of the show, made those little bumps for me. Um, not sure if that was the one where he's making fun of my hair, but who knows. Um, all right, uh, we do have Amanda Maki joining us right now. I, I pointed this out a little earlier. I want to get some insights from Amanda, if, if possible. But um, there is this old case out there. Um, it was banging around in the Supreme Court, you know, way back in the in the 40s, 45, 46, and the U.S. Supreme Court decision came out on this case. It was called Marsh v. Alabama, and um, it was decided on uh, January 7, 1946, and this case was about a large corporation who owned a town. They basically built a town for all their employees in, in Alabama. And because they owned the sidewalks in the town, they contended that they could not allow, they could um, prevent people from engaging in giving out religious pamphlets. And um, quite the decision came down. And I think that applies to the censorship that's going on with uh, social media right now. I want to ask um, my next guest about this and many other things. Amanda Mackey joins me right now. She's a Republican strategist and an attorney. Amanda, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, John. I'm hoping that I'm pronouncing your name properly. Yeah, you are. I'm close. Okay, good. So um, this is kind of a little obscure case. I'm so obsessed with... Um, the watching deterioration of free speech and, and freedom of expression. But um, this case, uh, the Supreme Court held, I want to read you this and you tell me what your thoughts are. I think it might help someone to bring an action, but it says that um, ownership does not always mean absolute dominion. The more an owner for his advantage opens up his property for use by the public in general, the more do his rights become circumscribed by the statutory and constitutional rights of those who use it. Thus, the owners of privately held bridges, ferries, turnpikes, and railroads may not operate them as freely as a farmer does his farm. So, Amanda, I don't know. I'm not an attorney, but I'm trying to understand how this is right this case kind of makes me feel like th th that maybe there's a still a leg to stand on. Well, look, you know, what has happened in the last week, it's, it's shocking and appalling because you're now restricting the rights of a sitting president of the United States and uh, four people who have, you know, given up, uh, given up their homelands to legally immigrate here like my family did. Uh, these are the kinds of things that that scare people because that's exactly what they escaped: the uh, censorship, the limiting of speech, the limiting of religion, the limitations that are set forth. That you know, um, th this is what Americans should fear. And so, um, when you have cases uh, like this that that uh, you know basically say to the contrary, that's important. And I think that's what Americans want to hear right now. They they want to they want to know that there are opportunities uh, for Americans to not have to be subject to such censorship, and why it's happening on just one side of the political spectrum and not the other is really shocking. And and look no further than the riots of last summer. How were those covered by the media? They certainly weren't censored. They certainly didn't say, you know, these people are being violent or being destructive or inciting violence. They never pointed to Kamala Harris or anyone else in the Democratic leadership who we have seen over and over, like Maxine Waters, uh, really gin up their base. We never see the left wing media, these big tech companies go after them. Yet they are quick to pin the blame of what happened last week on a, and lay it at the foot of one person, and that's President Trump. Yeah, I mean, uh, I was listening to Bill O'Reilly the other night on uh, on his radio show here in New York, and he was reading Donald Trump's uh, the ending of his statement like verbatim. You know, let's walk down to the Capitol together. 
and mm -hmm. peacefully and patriotically protest. Um, and O'Reilly is saying, you know, this is uh, called exculpatory evidence. If there was ever a real trial, not this show trial, um, any good defense attorney would just stand up and continue to read the exculpatory evidence. So let's walk down and peacefully and patriotically protest. That was the supposed call to action. And now they've made this thing um, incitement of insurrection. So it's so subjective to, you know, the state of mind of the person. And it, I don't even... I don't. I, I. I just. I, I don't get where it is in the law that you can just snap impeach a president because you don't agree with them. Well, obviously, this isn't the first time they've impeached. Uh, this is the second time they're they're seeking to again impeach. And this is the uh, what I call the aggressive progressive base of the party uh, pushing its leadership to do this. Uh, they are under this, you know, blind in their minds, you know, blind mandate they think they have to do the bidding of the, the progressive left. And I think if there's anything that they should have learned after eight years of Obama is that he lost multiple uh, legislative seats to the tune of over 800 state legislative uh, seats were lost in his eight years. Um, you had, I believe, uh, 37 state legislatures, House and Senate that were controlled by Democrats in his eight years, that fell by half. So they have to be really mindful of what they're doing here. And I truly believe they are they have gone way too far in what they're doing. And that's not where Americans want to be. In fact, 70% of Americans want Congress to be working on COVID relief. And, and, you know, getting COVID out to people, uh, or I'm sorry, getting the immunization, the vaccinations out to people, focusing on that rather than focusing on looking backwards, which is in essence what the Democrats are doing. But it's so partisan. It is so partisan what they're doing. And I think they're going to see revolt from anyone who's not part of the really the progressive base of the Democratic wing. Yeah, I mean, they, this is uh, I call it now progressive privilege. They just allowed to do this because they've been oppressed for so long that they're, they're privileged to do whatever they want. But uh, Amanda, a uh, for a little further than, than that, I almost feel like their actions of totally bastardizing the constitutional process of impeachment, their actions are almost painting them in the light of insurrectionists where they're trying to end a president's term because they don't want him to be able to run in four years. And, you know, you say they're looking backward. I almost think they're looking forward rather than address the problems that they wanted supposedly wanted to address when now that they have the ball and the majority in both houses why don't they pass some legislation instead they're wasting resources to try to impeach trump so he can't run again in four years it's like prevent defense well look i think really what this is about is they want to have uh members of the gop on record so that uh, if, if President Trump does decide to, in fact, as he has proclaimed many times, uh, primary these uh, candidates, uh, th that's, that's basically what he's going to look at. He's going to see who voted against him, who was with him and who was against him, and then go and primary those candidates and maybe make it more difficult for the Republicans to regain control of the House. I mean, you know, it's it's astonishing. Uh, he, Kevin McCarthy, only lost the gavel by six votes. That's how little confidence they have in Nancy Pelosi um, to vote for her on the Democrat side. But also it speaks volumes to the level of losses that Democrats sustained in uh, 2020. And a lot of that is attributable to the conservative, strong, and successful policies of President Trump. Yeah, I have to agree with you on that. It, it, it's, to me, the strangest thing ever. I've been a political wonk for years. Never seen anything like this where the top of the ticket loses, but everyone down ballot wins. Um, just strange as anything. But thank God we've got it that close. And uh, thank God. Well, we it, it's a lot of, you know, from, from my perspective, my theory on it is, 
It was a referendum on COVID. Are you for uh, wearing a mask? Or are you not for wearing a mask? Did you demonstrate the leadership on, you know, COVID and, and what did you do or what did you not do? And so for a lot of people, I think that's what it came down to. Uh, but I think, look at what President Trump did on COVID. He promised and he delivered, much like the four years that he had. Uh, he promised he would have vaccines to market before the end of the year. They said, oh, that's just a political ploy. It. Multiple vaccines are on the market now. Got it. All right, we got to leave it there. Amanda, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. We got to have you back soon. Amanda Mackey, uh, Republican strategist, also uh, attorney. Thanks, John. And, uh, really appreciate it. All right, we'll take a quick break. We'll come back and wrap up a uh, Woman Wednesday edition of Liquid Lunch right after this.